Hey guys, welcome to my shed on a Friday night. I am in here solving mysteries for you. They're not mysteries for me because I already know the answer here. Uh, but while you all are out skirting around and uh, floating around the beer joints or juke joints or whatever, I'm in here doing something semi-productive and I'm going to share this with you. Now, People that know me, whether it's in the political world or at work, they always say, you know what, he asks you a million questions and he's trying to help you figure things out for yourself. Well, some people find that annoying. Well, let me tell you something. A self-evolved person, look that one, a self-evolved person appreciates my Socratic, so Socratic, Socratic method of instruction, Socratic. So we're going to Socratically have you listen to me until you wear yourself out and then you can hear from me what it is you're trying to figure out. And we'll call that Soc Socratic and you can consider yourself semi self evolved. Now, why are you still here when I'm talking to you like this? Because you got to know what's in the case. So, yeah, this one is going to be very different. Let me ask you a question. Socratic exercise, get it? What kind of an arch top guitar has no F holes and no sound holes? You're probably thinking, well, if there's no F holes or sound holes, how does the sound get out of the guitar? Good question. So, do you really think that there's an arch top guitar that has no F holes or sound holes? Have you ever seen one? Well, guess what? You're going to see one here right now. Look at that. Does that look like it's arched to you right there? It sure does. Do you see any F holes? No. Do you see a sound hole? This is for a pickup, a single pickup. I need you to notice where the volume and tone control are for this single pickup. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. This is probably the worst one yet. It wanders all over the place, but anybody that knows me, I connect the dots in the end where you go, oh, 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 yeah. And when I get to the end with this one, when I finally have to tell you what kind of guitar this is after you make some Captain Obvious guesses and completely blow it, at the end, you're going to say, Ken, how is it that you knew what this guitar was the whole time? And I will say to you, how is it that you did not grasshopper. <laughs> so, that said, I want you to notice a couple things here. Does that look like a Gibson open book headstock? Big clue. Is there a number on the back that says 502 right there? Yeah, there is. Is there binding on this guitar? Yes. This piece is missing. I still have it. Is the back of it flat? It sure is. But is the top arched? Yes, it is. Notice those things because I'm going to take you down a long, torturous path. We are going to look at some things that are so cool you won't even believe it. And we're going to fix a guitar or two along the way in this round and round story in the end you will end up knowing what this is and if you think you have coveted my stuff in the past no you have not wait till you know the story behind this one so let's start with the first guitar that's going to lead us down the socratic path the socratic path to your self evolved personage self-evolved personage look that one up yeah i didn't invent that i am that but i didn't invent that so let's 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 get to the bench now okay i've decided to do a plot change early in the episode um 
before I go down the torturous path, which by the way is a mechanism by which self-flushing drip emitter technology works, torturous path of discovery through again the Socratic method. I want to show you a few things about this one up close. Book and headstock. That's Gibson all the way. Truss rod. Six peg holes. Let's go to the back first. 502, number 502 right there. This wire was not here, obviously. This is what was hanging it from the wall of the shop. I found it. I want you to pay close attention to this and this paint job. And I want you to notice that same paint job down here on this clunky, very characteristic shape next. And look, look at somebody had a, a perchance. I'm a regular encyclopedia for all tonight. I should travel and sell them, which is going to come into our story. One of these guitar manufacturers used to send people around to sell instruments like shoes or Tupperware or whatever. They used to do that when I was a kid. Anyway, look at this stuff. Here's the back. This thing's a little clunked up. Oh, by the way, this um, sunburst was done with varnish by someone we all know and love. It's got a single cutaway. The front binding is missing. It will surprise you when you see later what that is, but let me get this in the vise. A couple things I want you to notice here. There was a single pickup here. There is a screw hole here and one here. That could mean that the, that the pickup either sat in and the mount screws went like this and it could be raised up and down or it could have been a soap bar type or possibly even something that looked like a P90 but there's only holes there. I want you to notice the configuration of the two holes for potentiometers. That's going to become really important when we start making jumps into what this guitar is not rather than what it is. So, that said, I think you've had some time to look at it and begin your covetous sinning nature, sending it down its path. Now let's get back to that first guitar I was talking about. And it's an Oscar Schmidt guitar. Oscar Schmidt. Okay, we're going to get some work done while we're chatting Socratically. Do you see this? This is called a three-way switch. It's one of these configurations which looks like this when it's not in the car, in the guitar, in the car, in the guitar, excuse me. You got a ground lug over there and three lugs here. Uh, one is common in the, in the center that goes to your input jack and the other two go to your volume pots for your two pickups. Three-way switches are the blight of my existence. I'm dealing with artists all the time that will tell me, hook up two big Gibson 57s and put one volume control and be done with it. See if you can guess who that is. But we are going to weld, solder, excuse me, a new three-way switch in here. Now, how are we going to get it up in here? Well, I've shown you this before. You take a coat hanger, you bend it any way you want, you take it down in there and you fish some, help me here with one hand, dental floss, make a noose on the switch, which you can see I've got a fragment of it there and pull it into place once it's all soldered up. So what does this have to do with our story besides everything? Do you see this name on the headstock? Oscar Schmidt, and then it says by Washburn. So while we're getting this ready to go, I'm going to tell you about Oscar Schmidt. Oscar Schmidt and his brother, immigrant, immigrants from Germany, opened up an instrument company in 1879. That instrument company was called Oscar Schmidt. Imagine that. So, Oscar Schmidt Company went along for a while. Uh, their big thing was not guitars. 
they did some guitars that were more popular than others. Let me grab something here that you all have been asking about. Oh, look at this. Look what just happened. It didn't just happen. I've been waiting for a guitar like you to come into my life. Anyway, I'm ill prepared. Anyway, we'll get to this one in a minute. Oscar Schmidt Company built things like guitars, especially parlor guitars. And they built other things called auto harps, harpsichords. Remember that thing your music teacher used to do this with and move the thing up and down and press on this and do all that? And then you would go, oh my gosh, that's the most complicated mini harp I've ever seen. They also build things called zither, zither. Not a Dr. Seuss type zither. Yeah, that's me in real life. Do not mess with my trees. These are actually palm trees, not Prufalo Puffalo trees, but yeah, that's me. See? Yeah. See the semblance. Anyway, not this kind of zither. Anyway, about 1930s, early 1930s, Oscar Schmidt was having financial problems. They sold off their guitars to a couple different people. Remember, I told you they did. Stella, they came up with the name Stella for parlor guitars. When they sold to Harmony, guess what? The Stella Harmony, that's where that came from. Oscar Schmidt, remember, Oscar Schmidt sold out in the early 30s, sold out their guitar brand to other people. Let me fix this and I'll catch up. Okay, quickly, one more time. Three-way switches are a nightmare, but here's how they work. Ground lug here, three lugs here, center one to your input uh, on your jack, your input jack, uh, one each to your volume pots, which affect clicking on the two pickups. So, um, real quick here, I've got, I need this again, I've got a piece of coat hanger run through here, up here, with a piece of tape. I've got dental floss wrapped over itself on the tape. And then at the end, I've tied a little noose like a choker. See this? I can put my thumbs in here, go like this, and make a little noose. And that goes around here, the switch. And I tighten that up like that. Now, I take my soldering iron. I always want to have a wet sponge. That's how I clean the tip. I take some solder. I touch and make sure that these are shiny. I don't want them dull. They've already been done. Then, once I've got everything ready to go, I take the tape off and I pull my dental floss up through here. See, there it is, like that. And then when I feed my three-way switch down in here, oops, I forgot. What I really want to do is I want to plug the switch into my little amp back here. And we'll see. That's in the center. That one works. That one works. I pop this one this way. That one works. This one does not. I flip it the other way. This one works. This one does not. Perfect. Now, that said, I pop this up. I make sure that this is like this. You see that? I drop this down in here like so and then I just simply work this until I get it to here and look at that it popped right up bingo okay so we're done with this Oscar Schmidt everything works on it and it will go into the 
mill of guitars get traded off for something else. Anyway, shine it up a little bit. Um, remember the name Oscar Schmidt, and remember that about 1930, somewhere around there, Oscar Schmidt saw, started selling off its guitar line, its full-size guitar line, and some of its parlor size stuff, which is where the name Stella came from, Oscar Schmidt, and it went to Harmony. So just remember that time frame because we're going to talk about something else that was happening about the same time, 1930, 1932. Okay, if you're one of those people that uh, is in the analytics saying that you leave at 7 minutes and 22 seconds, too bad for you. The rest of you, this is going to turn so unbelievable that you're not even going to believe it. Wow. Okay, so we're talking about 1932. What was going on in 1932? Well, businesses were crashing, stock market crashed, the Great Depression, all this kind of thing. Gibson, uh, who had been out selling mandolins to every town had a mandolin orchestra their guitars were great whatever um, there were a lot of immigrants coming into the country at that time and you would have people that were craftsmen wood craftsmen so you had trades people it wasn't just you know go to home depot it was you were an apprentice and then you were a master uh, craftsman and and so when you get people like that working wood and you're doing arch tops after Lloyd Lohr come into a Gibson and, and, and started doing F holes and ornate things like that and, you, and you're having craftsmen do the bracing inside the guitar, when you start cutting corners and globbing glue on there and it turns into a mess and the guitars sound uh, like a basketball when you thump on it or a watermelon, there started to be some quality issues. So about 1932, there was a guy in New York that had been apprenticing for his uncle. And this guy's name was John D'Angelico. And what he did was he basically traced out a couple of Gibson guitars and started building them. Now, John D'Angelico, uh, there were people around it was more like if you live in LA, there's a garment district, there's a jewelry district, there's different districts. And uh, back in New York at that time, I guess there were people who were, you know, working in what we would call a luthier shop or a guitar factory. And there wasn't this, you know, $50,000 thing going on and everything had to have sonic resonance measurements. You had good craftsmen building good solid guitars. And so when John D'Angelico started his business, he had a couple of these people come in, and one of them is going to be really important in this story in a little bit. But a um, couple of things here. This is a great book, Acquired of the Angels. This is a playoff on the last names of John D'Angelico and Jimmy DeQuisto. Jimmy DeQuisto ended up working with John D'Angelico, and when... Uh, John died, he was heir apparent to the business, but there were some financial issues, an attorney got involved, um, there's some seedy stuff going on here. At one point, they basically took Jimmy's whole shop, all the wood, all everything, out because he couldn't come up with a certain amount of money. Um, and so, you all might have figured out, I have um, searches going on quite a bit. Oh yeah, don't forget this book. Paul William Schmidt. Paul William Schmidt. This is a great book. It's a little bit pricey, but a lot of pictures in here anyway. So, where was I? I have searches going on for certain things, names, parts, different things, you know, uh, there's a lot of historics in my guitars. So I have a search going on for a couple of names. And I get a hit one day. And I'm reading something where someone says that they have guitar sides that they were handed by Jimmy DeQuisto. Where's that other magazine? Here's another, here's another good magazine. Um, 20th Century Guitar. Volume 2, number 2, March and April 1991. Big, big section on Jimmy DeQuisto. Also, it has a serial number list of all the guitars he ever built. This is a good one. Anyway, 
back this up a little bit. When John D'Angelico was playing or building his guitars, on Saturday mornings, he would have somebody come in to play his guitars. You've seen me do this with different artists. Frank Goldwasser, perfect example. I can't play guitar, I hand him one of mine. He, he takes it to town and people realize, okay, these guitars play and I just watch that happen. So there was a guitar virtuoso came in named Al Valenti. Remember that name, Valenti, Al Valenti. And he used to play John's guitars and people would see that, buy the guitars, order the guitars. So, I get a, an alert that something is going on and what it says is this person has guitar sides that were handed to him by Jimmy DeQuisto himself and within the story there is the reference that, to tell you the story, the young man um, was looking for a job. His family suggested that because he was working in a guitar shop already, that they had heard that Jimmy DeQuisto himself wanted an apprentice. So he decided to go over there. He talked to Jimmy. This person's last name is very similar to the guitar virtuoso that used to play and demonstrate John D'Angelico's guitars. Anyway, I haven't quite made that connection yet. But he sat with Jimmy talked to him for a while, and before he left, Jimmy DeQuisto handed him these guitar sides that have been shaped already, and said, these came out of Johnny's shop. I wonder who Johnny would have been. Maybe John D'Angelico? Maybe these sides came out of the shop and were left over to seconds that the people who took all the equipment that time and loaded it all up didn't take? Which means these very guitar sides that I have right here were once in the hands of John D'Angelico, possibly, and we know for certain, Jimmy DeQuisto. Now, Jimmy DeQuisto went on to share his talents with names that we all know, like Parker, Manzer, and influence the high-end arch tops that we see today. Now, there's somebody that's very special to me that has had an influence on me, um, and I am going to, now that I've shared this story with you, I'm going to take two of these and send them off to that person. But I am literally holding things that were in Jimmy DeQuisto's shop, and I have a good reason to believe that they were also in... John D'Angelico shop, which brings us to the next part of our story. Let's talk about what was going on in 1932 again. Oh yeah, somebody will want to see it. There they are. I can't believe I have these. The person that uh, got them to me was very gracious with the story and understood they were important to me. And um, I'm glad I have them. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, only here, people, only here. I swear I'm the luckiest person in the world. And um, there's a lot of people that support me out there. There's a myriad of people who send me little bits and pieces of wood from here and there that end up being relics on my guitars and stuff, and I appreciate every one of you. But let's get back to 1932. So you've apparently got a part uh, in New York and in New Jersey, certain places like uh, Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, you've got groups of people that are cranking out guitars um, for basically the beginner market. That's where the money was at back then. People learn how to play guitar. Um, so you're cranking out instruments in a factory and then you got people like John D'Angelico who's basically capitalizing off of the dec declining quality that Gibson was putting out at the time, spending more time on braces and things like that and players were playing them and saying, hey, there is a difference. Gibson back then was reduced to doing anything they could to survive, including making wooden toys. If you ever flip a wooden toy over, it says Gibson on the bottom. Yeah, set it back down, call me right away and just walk away. Just walk away, it'll be fine. Anyway, 
So about 1932, John D'Angelico decides, I am going to start building these guitars. So he hires a few people. Amongst those people is a person named Frank Forsillo. Frank Forsillo. He works with John D'Angelico a couple years when John started up about 1932. Um, Frank had an opportunity to stay, but John D'Angelico was about making single high quality instruments one at a time and having a few going on in the shop. Where Frank Forsillo decided, I want to be more on the larger production end of things. So about 1940, some former employer employees of Oscar Schmidt, remember that, Oscar Schmidt, decided that they were going to start making guitars and they were going to form the United Guitar Company. They put $100 each in, seven or eight of them. Frank was in, but he did not have the money. And so Frank was kind of the brains, Frank Fursillo was kind of the brains behind all of this. And about uh, sometime in the 50s, 1950, he put this patent out there that basically looks like a, a John D'Angelico uh, headstock with the finial and all this kind of stuff and had some patents put out there. Um, but Frank Fursillo ended up being a big uh, thing at the United States Guitar Company. Now, the United States Guitar Company was not like Harmony and Kay who would they would they called him being a jobber. You would make guitars for all these other people, Western Auto, Sears, Montgomery Wards, whoever you could put their brand on it. But you also made your own stuff like K and Harmony. So we all know Harmony Rocket, different K arch tops, um, and there were the equivalents in Silvertone Airline or whatever. Uh, the United States Guitar Company did not do that. They were strictly a jobber and they would put out different kinds of uh, guitars for all different people and one of those guitars was sold under the brand name U.S. Strad. Now this guitar is the second arch top I ever bought. I went over to a place called Moore Park about an hour and a half away from me one day and bought this thing um, and I have to say as far as guitars go it's about the clunkiest thing you could possibly have. It is an arch top, you can see that. Um, but there's nothing to write home to mom about with this one. It's arched front and back. Uh, but look at the neck. It is thick, bulky, clunky. Um, the wood is, I don't know, it appears to be solid, but this thing's a clunky guitar. It's nothing acoustically fine. But it's something you could play forever and not tear up. So, what does all this have to do with that first guitar I showed you, besides everything? Okay, so here it is again. No F holes, arch top. So when I did a post on this, on uh, my social media, uh, people were coming back. That is a Hofner Club guitar. And John Lennon played one of these, so it has to be one. Guess what? The holes for the volume and tone pots on those run this way. Headstock's not the same. Guild might have made these. Well, headstock doesn't match up. It just doesn't match up. So then I get a message from my friend Iris Spin. Iris Spin. Yeah, that's real. And he sends me a picture. And guess what? It's got the Gibson open book headstock. We're talking about numbers on the back. And it's got, remember this? Yeah, it's got that same paint job. And you remember this clunky looking neck? Well, guess what, people? Yeah. This guitar is not a Guild. It's not a Hofner. It is an Orpheum guitar. 
under the brand name Premier, made by, that's right, the United States Guitar Company around 1959, 1960. It came, it had a single pickup. I got a spec sheet over here that's trying to tell me this. It had a single pickup. They also had a model that had two pickups with two sets of controls. But this guitar was made in the factory of Frank Forcello, who spent time with John D'Angelico. Now, it's admitted in uh, S. Nathaniel Adams. S. Nathaniel Adams. I'm going to give you a link below. Did some interviews and stuff. Again, the guy is... Look up his site. I'll give you a link below. Anything you want to know about a K or a Harmony or anything, he's there for you. Anyway, um, it turns out that it was discovered that some of the archtop bodies that John D'Angelico was using were coming out of Frank Fursillo's factory, and then John would take them into his shop and put them together, uh, put the neck on them and do that kind of thing. So there was a kind of a relationship um, with the two of them for quite some time. Um, now, as luck would have it, or fate, or whatever, um, the Fretted Instrument Company, which was also the United States Guitar Company, ended up having some problems, um, and guess who bought them out? Yeah, Oscar Schmidt Company, uh, and they have a, uh, a new parent company. But anyway, it's funny. The story starts in 1879 and loops back into to now where we're fixing a three-way switch on an Oscar Schmidt by Washburn. That's who their parent company is, Washburn. Um, and I just happen to have all this stuff by luck that ties this all together. And if you believe this story, well, then you've watched <laughs> the end of the video. Um, I am going to... Isn't it sad that the binding, the front binding is missing off of this? Well, guess what? It's not. I have it. Um, it just dried out a little bit. It'll all piece right back in. Everything will be fine here. But I'm going to dress this thing out. There is a Franz type pickup. Franz, F-R-A-N-Z. Looks like a soap bar, kind of, with a white cover. If you have one of those uh, let me know. Get a hold of me. My email's at the end. But I think I'm going to put a set of Grover Imperials on this and, and make it nice. And um, again, the person I got this from, they were very gracious uh, with getting it to me. They actually did this sunburst with lacquer. Uh, couldn't be a finer job. Anyway, that's the end of this story. I've got a package to wrap up to get those guitar sides out in the mail. As always, Thanks for watching through to the end. Give me a like and a subscribe if you haven't. And I will see you next time. I don't know how I'm going to top this one, but I have several to pick from, so I'll see you again soon.